Uh, tonight, you'll have to bear with me. I have a little sore throat, so I, I'm not able to talk very loudly. So please bear with me, as I said. Luckily, it's not such a big room, so it should be OK. Um, all right, how are you all doing? Good, how are you? I'm not well, but otherwise, well, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Uh, so the deal is this. We are going to, I'd like to go ahead with the uh, chapter 14, or actually 13 it is. Um, which deals with curves and level surfaces and level sets. But there are still, I feel, some unfinished business, especially in light of the quiz coming up. So rather than move ahead too much or even to keep up with exactly where you were yesterday, I think it might be a little valuable to go back over a few problems. So for things like vectors and surfaces and sketching, how does that sound as a plan, at least for the first sort of section of this? A question over here. I have money falling out of my pocket. It is five dollars. Okay. This is for whoever answers the following question correctly. No, actually, I can't really do that. Thank you for that, though. Thank you for that. Don't even think about it. I, uh, any anything else? Is that what you were going to say as well? Okay. Did you know how much it was? No, I. Okay. You know, Australian money is all different colours. Anyway, here is a great problem that comes from a quiz back in fall of 2003. And I'd like you to, well, I'll tell you what it is, and I'll give you a little, a little bit of time to shoot on it. So you have four points. One, zero, one. One, three, four. Zero, two, two and three, two, five. So part one is to show that these points lie in a plane. Now, of course, three points lie in a plane. There's nothing special about that. But four points need not lie in a plane. In fact, a general randomly chosen selection of four points will not lie in a plane. So there's something special about four points that lie in a plane. That's what part A is. And part B is to find the area of the quadrilateral with these points as corners. Okay, so obviously we worry about part B later. So part A, I'd like you to just take a minute and think about how you would go about doing it. If you already, if it's instantly obvious to you, then by all means go ahead and do it. But how would you show that these four points in space lie in a plane? Just, just think about it for a little bit. Oh, this is riveting if you're watching on, on line, but hopefully you are also thinking about this. And the point is to think how, we, how you would go about doing it. So just as a rough show of hands, uh, and there's no, nothing involved, no shame involved, you don't have to admit anything if you don't want to, but I'm just curious who, has, who thinks they have a good idea of how to approach the problem. All right, it's a, a, reasonable, a reasonable selection. So the, now, out of the people who do, who would like to volunteer how they think they would like to do it? Okay, go ahead. Um, maybe you could figure out an equation for the plane of three points and then 
All right, so one way of doing it is indeed to find the equation of a plane through three of the points and then see if the fourth one lies on that plane. Okay, who also had that idea of how to do it? All right, did anyone have a different method of doing it? Okay, what is, what is your method? Find three vectors from one point to the rest of the three. Yes. So that they're... Um, no, you're on the exactly. Vector, yeah, so that between every two vectors, the perpendicular it has the same slope. All right, uh, that that slope. could definitely work. Um, but rather than repeat it, I want to know: Did anyone have any idea of finding these vectors and doing something with them? Yes. Okay, so that's that, but that's still the same thing as uh, as there. But there's something you can do with three of the vectors that will instantly show you that they're in the same plane without even finding the equation of the plane. Does anyone know? Yes? The dot product. It's close to a dot product, but that, that's only with two vectors. What can you do with three vectors? Triple box product. Right, so the triple box product finds the volume of the parallelopiped spanned by three vectors. But if they're in the same plane, then what's that volume going to be? Zero, because the thing is all squished down. So the only way the volume could be zero is either if they're in the same plane or if two of the vectors are sort of on top of each other. But if two of the vectors are on top of each other, then they're in the same plane anyway. So basically, the, the snazzy way and all the other ways that were suggested are, are fine too. But the snazzy quick way is to find those three vectors. So we've got to pick one of these as a base. Since this one was first, I'll think of this as the base. And I'll find the vector from the base to here, from the base to here, and from the base to here. So let's write down three vectors, which I'll call u, v, and w. u is 1, 3, 4, minus 1, 0, 1, which will be 0, 3, 3. So that's u. V will be the base one, uh, will be, sorry, the second point, 0, 2, 2, minus the base 1, 0, 1. And that works out to be negative 1, 2, and 1. And finally, W will be 3, 3 2, 5, minus the base 1, 0, 1. And that is 2, 2, Four. So those are the three vectors. So just to sort of reiterate what we've done, we had the four points, whatever they look like. So I'm just taking the vectors from that base point, and I, I don't know which order they're in, but one of them's u, one of them's v, and one of them's w. All right, so now all I have to do is take the triple box product, which is u cross, well, u dot v cross w. It doesn't actually matter which order they're in absolute value. So what we're going to do is take the determinant, actually this is without the absolute value, that quantity is the determinant of the matrix whose rows are these vectors here. So I just copy them there. Now just to contrast this with a regular cross product, if it was just the cross product, then the top row is i, j, k, and what you end up with is a vector. But here's the dot product of two vectors, one of which is a cross product, and so, of course, the answer has to be a number. So you should not be surprised to see no vector type of stuff in here. The answer of this is a number, which is fine because we're looking for a volume, and we're hoping that volume is zero. Okay, so... We are blessed in a way with the zero here because it means the first term is gone. Zero times whatever that subdeterminant is. So the next one will be minus because the middle one gets a minus. Three times the determinant of this submatrix here as a two by two. So it's minus three times minus four minus two plus three times this subdeterminant which is minus 1 times 2 is minus 2, minus 2 times 2 is minus 4. 
And so you get negative 3 times negative 6 is 18, plus 3 times minus 6 is minus 18, and you get 0. So the justification is that the parallel piped, parallel, what is it, Le piped, uh, that letter I think is an E, but spanned by U, V, and W has zero volume. So U, V, W lie in the same plane, or in a plane. So that is quicker than finding the equation of the plane and seeing that the other vector is in it, but not that much quicker. So I, I totally pay the other method. It's just that's kind of snazzier. Any questions about part A of this? All right, so how are we going to do part B? Anyone have any ideas about part B? This is now to find the area of this quadrilateral, which is by no means necessarily uh, a, a, a parallelogram. It's just some random quadrilateral. So how would we find its area? Two triangles. Two triangles. Yes, I think that's a good idea. If we find the area of this triangle and the area of this triangle and put them together, we should, get, we should be in good shape. Can anyone see any little problem with this, perhaps? What could be a problem with this? Yeah, see, what if actually it looks like this? What if this is U, this is V, this is V, and this is W, and we find the UV area is this, and the VW area is this, and we just try to add them together. That's not going to be correct. So somehow we have to arrange the vectors in the correct order. That's a, this is a hard question. I mean, this is probably about as hard as these sorts of things get. So does anyone have any idea as to how to arrange the U, V, and W so that they're going around? I, see, I, I don't know which one is which. I mean, here they are in space. Maybe you could do it visually, 0, 3, 3, minus 1, 2, 1. But there's a, there's a way you can actually just, just real set, really settle it. Do you, do you know? Taking the cross product will give you the area. OK, so taking the, the cross product will give you the area. It's true. But it also gives you something else. So first of all, what does the, we're going to need the area. So I agree that taking the cross product will get you the area. So how do you find the area of a triangle spanned by two vectors, u and v, first of all? Someone? Half, the, half of the length of the cross product. So we're going to need u cross v. Remember, that is a vector whose length is equal to the area of the parallelogram. So half of this is the area of the triangle, which is what we're looking for. But there's a little thing more that you learn from the cross product, which is what? It's not just, it's not just the magnitude, but the direction tells you something. It, well, it's not the angle. It gives you the normal. But it tells you whether it's in, out of the board or into the board. In this case, if I use the right-hand rule, u, v, W, the normal will be out of the board, whereas if it was actually this way, the normal would be into the board. So now I ask again, how can you tell what order the vectors are in by using their various cross products? Go ahead. We can set, for example, z to be positive in both of the new cross products. Right, so... And then we just, it's easier to see. We can look just on the y-axis, see what's higher. OK. Not quite sure I sure exactly understand. So what's z or z? Let's say we take both of the z's to be z's. z's so you mean the normals? Positive, yeah. Which normals? The normals for the two... U cross, U cross V, U cross and, v. and? 
and well, okay. Let let me. You're on the right track. Let me just sort of point out something. Okay. Suppose the vectors are ordered like this. Tell me about the directions of u cross v and v cross w. They are the same directions. Now suppose that they're ordered like this. They'll be opposite. If I do u cross v, it'll be into the board, right? u, v, in. Whereas if I do v cross w, v cross w, out. So one way to tell is to compute these and see what happens. So we may, let us prepare to compute u cross v and v cross w and u cross w. We may have to compute all three. But if we're lucky, the first two that we choose will be in the same direction and will be done. I'm sorry, but this is how you have to do this, I think. I can't think of a different way of doing it. So we've got three possibilities, u cross v, v cross w, and u cross w. And we need two of them. Okay, there's no other possibilities because v cross u is just minus u cross v. So which do we feel luckiest about? Which two out of three? <laughs> we got to get them both right. So which one? It's just a, just a guess probably, unless you want to draw the picture. Well, I mean, we, we already have a base point, but we just have three vectors, and we, have, we don't know which way around they are. So shall we just try u cross v and v cross w? Or does someone feel like u cross w? I don't know, maybe someone's already drawn a picture and got a better intuition for it. Let's just tr compute what u cross v is. What the hey? So u cross v is i, j, k, 0, 3, 3, uh, minus 1, 2, 1. Determinant of that. So I'm going to be a little quicker about it. 3 minus 6. So it's minus 3i. J, one, 0, plus 3, but a minus for the middle. K, 3. So I get K, so I get minus 3i. Minus 3j plus 3k. OK, let's do v cross w. i, j, k. Actually, let's do u cross w. What the heck? It's easier to compute. 0, 3, 3, that's u. And w is 2, 2, 4. But I am prepared to, to get the wrong one. In fact, I probably am. 3 times 4 is 12. Minus that, so I get 6i, j. I get minus 6, but it's plus 6j and k minus 6k. So it's the other way. You see, this is minus 2 times this, so they point in opposite directions. By the way, see these two computations? How does that also, just those two already, answer part A? Can anyone tell me how actually this is another way of doing part A? Uh, yeah. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that they're in the opposite direction. What is, what is an opposite? Sorry, it's cross by. Okay, so yeah. that means the normal to the plane containing u and v is the same direction as the plane containing u and w. Yeah. So actually, if we followed what most of you wanted to do and actually found the planes by finding the normals and seeing that you've got a point on both planes, so hey, the two planes have this, the plane containing u and v has the same normal to the plane containing u and w, and yet they share the vector u, so they must be the same plane. That's another way of doing part a. In any case, the fact that it's the wrong way means that actually I think to compute u cross w, and so this computation was redundant. Let's just do it. V is minus one two one. W is two two four. And so I get 8 minus 2 is 6. Minus 4 minus 2 is, is uh, minus 6, but the j has a switch the sign. And then k I get minus. So actually, these are the two that are in the same direction. So those are the two that I need. So what does this mean? It means that the orientation of u, v, w is correct. 
that's the way they are. Or actually, possibly the other way around, because it depends on your frame of reference. But the, the point is, u and v are in the same relationship as v and w. So uh, it, actually, u and w is in the same relationship. Well, that doesn't look right. So what do we make of this? u and v goes negative. So what is the correct relationship? That is not true at all. <laughs> so let's be very careful here. Sorry? V, W, W cross U. Actually, U cross V. Sorry? Yeah, you still don't know what is in between. It's in between or above. So you can still calculate your own triangles. Well, Yes. You have to be between V and W. Yeah, the way I was thinking of it is if we had also written W cross U, we would get the negative of this, which would be the same as U cross V. So actually, if you do W, then U, then V, you'll be in good shape. Okay, so another way of thinking of this is V cross U. Well, let's go from W cross U. So W cross U is minus 6i minus 6j plus 6k, which is in the same direction as U cross V, which so I claim if we go from W to U, we have the same direction normal vector as U to V. So that's the order that I think it is. So. so to get the, this area, I take the half of the W cross U. So that is one half of the length of this vector. Root minus 6 squared plus minus 6 squared plus 6 squared. Well, that's 3 lots of 36. So this will be a half times 6 root 3 otherwise known as 3 root 3 units squared. And now let's do the other one. A half of u cross v is 1 half square root minus 3 squared plus minus 3 squared plus 3 squared. So this will be 3 halves root 3 units squared. So the total area is 3 plus 3 halves times root 3, which is otherwise known as 9 halves root 3 units squared. Question. Can you explain how you got that order again? Like, I understand that it has to be the same direction, but like, I can the order to be, say, u, v, v, w, or u, w, w, v. I, I wanted them to be in the same direction, and I wanted them to be the same sign. So I looked at it. I said, these two are in the same sign, but it didn't really help me, because w was sort of in the, in the, in the right. right. Uh, so I kind of just mentally thought, oh, which, which pair can I pick so that I get a cyclic version? Okay. So I was like, u, v, this one could be w, u, w, u, v, but of course if you flip those around then you have to change the sign of this. All right, does that, does that make sense? I was sort of playing around with it there, but I, I like to give you an insight into my mental processes. You can tell that v and u, w are opposite, which means u probably ought to be in the middle. Okay, that's another way of looking at it. u, v and u, w are opposites, so u is, is in the middle. That's, that's fair enough. All right. A question about this example? About this. Here you didn't take the square root of the square. What, here? Right I never took the... What, what do you mean the square root of a square? Because the, the area is zero, but the area is just the length of the vector. And the length of the vector no, is no, the this, this is not a, 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 an area. This triple box product is actually a volume of a parallel a pipette, and there's no square root in the formula. Okay. Someone else had a question about this example? Okay, it's pretty hard, right? That's, as I say, that's about as hard as you might expect. All right. 
But just, yeah, it's not a bad idea to try to sketch the points. Then, then maybe we could have uh, eliminated the need for, for this. Suppose I do uh, for, for this sort of computation. Suppose we try it. 0, 3, I'm going to move the base down to 0 so I can get a grip on it. So I'm going to sketch u is 0, 3, 3. So it lies in this x, this y, z plane. Well, even if you did the original four points you were given. Well, if you did the original four points you were given, it'll be even more difficult. What we've done effectively is shifted the origin so that the first one of the points is now at the origin. It doesn't affect the volume. But I want to show you how hard it is to visualize these things in two dimensions. U lies in this plane here, the y, z plane. But how about V? V is at minus 1, comma 2, comma 1. So it's got to go backwards that way, but into the board for the y-axis and up. And so there's V. As for W, that's 2, 2, 4. So 2, 2, and 4 high, W. But I think you can see from that that actually U is in between V and W. So maybe that would have saved us a few seconds, and we would have to to compute W cross U and U cross V. So I was saying before, maybe we should try to get the geometry. This also might have looked better if I had gone and taken this as X, and this as Y, and this as Z, and tried to plot the points. But it's, it's difficult. I mean, what you'd really love to have is some magic pen that just you know draws in air and leaves a little trail for the time being, and then you can plot the points and see what's going on. And who knows, maybe in 10 years when I'm coming back to this class, I will have exactly such a thing. Yeah, it's not that far away in a way. I mean, they can do it with plastic. Do you ever see this, this video on the, on the web? I saw it about a year ago. Um, some, some furniture designer, they, they, they've hooked up a, a little uh, grid and there's sensors and there's this magic wand and when you press the button, it draws a trail. And this woman sort of went, there and she sketched out the back of a chair and drew in, a ch drew in the legs and she had really good spatial perception and, and just drew it. And, uh, and then this, this, plas this machine just spurts out this sort of plastic in exactly the way that she drew it, uh, at which solidifies and you end up with this sort of this, this chair that looks like it was just drawn. It's amazing. I'm not making this up. <laughs> it also, I mean, I'm sorry. Oh, sure. It's probably on YouTube somewhere. I'll, I'll see if I can find it. I mean, it's... That would be excellent. Okay. Okay, the request has been made to post this on the website, so... Yeah. Maybe I'll just bring it in next week and show you. No. <laughs> I'll see. I mean, the actual apparatus. Uh, no, I'll... I'll uh, yeah, I'll, I'll look for it. I'll, it's been a while since I've seen it. I've deleted the email, but I'm sure I can find it. Now, anyway, any more questions about this example? All right. How about some surfaces? So for surfaces, of course, I have some examples. I talked about it last week. And I, th I think the most important thing about what I said, really, is the classification. Rather than try to guess what it looks like, you can always try to sketch some points and let one of the variables be 0 and see what happens. But it really helps if you know what you're looking for. It really helps if you can say, oh, that is a hyperbolic paraboloid. Or, which you can do, which you can do. And I gave the classification last time. So just for the record, here is how I do the classification. So. Is it the part of the quiz, by the way? I think for the first one, quiz. Can anyone refute that statement? I haven't seen the quiz, but does anyone deny that surfaces could be on the quiz? They are on the quiz. OK, well, they, when you say they are on the quiz, they are eligible to be on the quiz. Now, chances are that there would be something on the quiz if they're eligible, but you never know. Uh, so the answer seems, to, the consensus seems to be yes. Yeah, my understanding is everything from weeks one and two is fair game for the quiz. All right, so that's up to last Friday. All right, please bear with me. Again, my voice is a little sore, so I have to talk a little quieter. So here goes the classification of how the surfaces work. First of all, if one variable is missing, it's a cylinder. And it doesn't have to be a cylinder in the regular sense. It could be an elliptical or a hyperbolic or any curve just copied. I mean, if I take that curve, a cylinder in it is like a sheet 
just copied all in one direction. And the direction it's copied in is the direction of the variable that's missing. So a cylinder along the missing variable. Okay. So that's a little bit different from all the rest of them. It doesn't have to be a quadric surface in particular. It can be any function. You could take sine x and make a cylinder out of it. Y equals sine x. If you just draw that in three dimensions, you just draw y equals sine x flat and just extend it up like this, except it will be in the z direction. So that's not a very interesting one, but it does pop up. So here are the other sort of prototypical interesting ones. So if it looks like something x squared plus something y squared plus something z squared equals something. Okay, I'm just going to, you know, I should put a, you know, b, c, d, but I want you to think of it as just x squared. This something just stretches the direction or, or shrinks it. So it's not really important in terms of the general categorization. It does sort of set the shape when you're done. But what is this? This is an ellipsoid. And how do I know? Because they're all squares and they're all positive. There's an imputed plus here. So all squares, all positive. Now, by the way, of course, the z squared could be over here, and you just have to put it over there. This can be... Over there, then it's minus here. Well, I mean, suppose it was x squared plus y squared equals 1 minus z squared. Yeah. So you bring the z squared over, and it becomes plus. So I'm trying to say, you know, you might have to shuffle it around a little bit. We don't always like to lay it out there for you. We like to mix it up a little bit. But nevertheless, if it comes into that form, it's an ellipsoid. In fact, this had better be positive as well. If that was zero, zero, then it would just be the origin. <laughs> x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals zero. The only way the squares can be z the sum of squares can be zero, even if there's positive multiples, three x squared, seven y squared, half z squared, they'd all have to be zero. And if this is negative, you couldn't even have a solution. That would be a pretty nasty trick question. But generally, that's going to be an ellipsoid. Okay, now, how about if they're all squares, but only two of them are positive? Something x squared plus something y squared minus something z squared equals something or other. Well, now, the question is, so two positive, all squares, two positive. Two positive, one negative. Now, it depends on what you have here. What if you have zero? So you have x squared plus y squared minus z squared equals zero. You get a cone or elliptical cone. If it's positive, you get the hyperboloid of one sheet. I didn't just draw the ellipsis. The ellipsoid is like this. Last week, of course, I did more thorough sketches. Here you get hyperboloid of one sheet. which was sort of like this. So it's like a funnel, but it doesn't quite get to the point. It just it gets thinner, but then it gets fatter again. Whereas if it's negative, you get a hyperboloid of two sheets, which is like an infinite bowl and another infinite bowl that's mirror image to it. And the lines around the bowl, which are level sets, as it turns out, although we haven't gotten up to that yet in these review sessions at least, uh, are ellipses. And the lines here are ellipses and the line, the, the curves, well, I say lines, I mean curves here. These are all supposed to be ellipses. Circles are also ellipses. They're just balanced. All right, question. Are hyperboloids, all hyperboloids aren't really cones, but this cone is a sort of degenerate hyperboloid in a way. Um, so a cone is, a, well this particular cone, an elliptical cone is a, is a, it's the, what you get when you are in between this case and this case. 
somehow there's one specific shape in the middle that's neither one sheet or two sheets. It's sort of two sheets that are joined at a point to make one. So the cone is a hyperbola in, in a way. All right, any other questions so far? Now, what if two are negative and one is positive? Flip it around. You can always ensure that two are positive and one is negative. Okay, minus x squared, minus y squared, plus z squared equals one. Just multiply the equation by minus one. If all three are negative, then you can turn them all into positive and hope that you get an ellipsoid. So these are really the only two cases where they're all squares. All right? However, there's also the possibility that one of them is not squared, like x squared plus y squared minus z equals zero. And actually, this plus or minus sort of affects the direction of it. Oh, let me be consistent with the previous notation, right? Something x squared plus something y squared plus or minus something z equals zero. This will give you a paraboloid, and as it turns out, an elliptical paraboloid. And that would either be something like, if this is the z-axis, it would either be something like this or something like this, upside down. And again, these are ellipses. So the difference between this and this is that the cross-section here is a parabola, whereas the cross-section here is a hyperbola. Hyperbola. Hyperbola has an asymptote. Parabolas don't have an asymptote. They just keep getting wider and wider. So y equals x squared compared with y equals 1 over x. That's the... So they're, they're different curves. Another way of looking at it, in fact, all of these curves are conic sections. So if you, bless you, if you take a regular cone, double-sheeted cone, a parabola is what you get. So imagine this cone like this. A parabola is what you get if you slice parallel to this line here. Whereas a hyperbola is what you get if you slice more like vertically. You get that and that. And an ellipse is what you get if you slice more horizontally. So all the different hyperbolas and parabolas and circles and ellipses and everything come from cutting a cone or different cones in, in different ways. But anyway, that's philosophy. Well, it's math. It's not <laughs> philosophy as far as 201 is concerned. All right, so the sine of z determines whether it's up or down. So this would be minus z in this equation, and this would be plus z. But that's easy enough to diagnose. Now, that's if... That's with two squares, both pluses. Whereas we could have something x squared minus something y squared plus or minus something z equals zero. And this is like two squares, one plus. and one minus. And when I say two squares, the point is x squared and y squared, but z is not a square. It's a linear. So only two squares, both plus, or if they're of opposite signs, you get this hyperbolic paraboloid, which is nasty to draw. But depending on what the signs of the things are, as I showed you last week, it looks something like this. So it has a saddle point in the middle. That's right. So you get a saddle point here at the origin. So the axes cut through this. And it's characterized by having a parabola in one direction along the xy plane, or the xz plane in this case, and a parabola going the opposite way orthogonal to it. So it would have been nice if I had two wires. Hmm. I have... How about this? May I just grab this? Sorry. <laughs> All 
All right. Ta-da! Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> These wires are at right angles to each other, at least when I stand this way. But one of the parabolas is up, and the other one is down. That's the saddle point. Okay, that's what this is supposed to be here. Any of these graphs can always be shifted by replacing x by x minus a, y by y minus b, and z minus z by z minus c, and that will shift the origin to a, b, c. Uh, question. Now, are these all set to zero just for simplicity, or does it have to equal zero? Well, again, if you replace this by say six then you can put it over with the z and it becomes z minus 6 and that will shift the thing up by 6. So it's the same sort of question. Um, in fact, if the x is replaced by x minus 3, which shifts the picture 3 along to the right along the x-axis, it had better be x minus 3 all squared. You may even have to complete the square to get it to look like that. right? But there's, if there's just a 6 here, it goes with the z. It goes with the z because you don't have to complete any square. There are some other questions as well. Was that, was that the question? OK. All right, so that's the classification. Although you can reconstruct it, I strongly advise you to sort of learn these prototypes. It will save you time. Question. So the, the saddle equation will go up on the positive squared axis, down on the negative squared Yeah, the way to tell, of course, then the question is how do you actually do these things. The way to tell is to set one of the variables equals 0. So if it's like, suppose we just consider of course, you can always just relabel the axes. That's the other sneaky thing to do. Just draw the way you know and then relabel the axes. And if you, have to, if you have to label this axis as z, then write a little instruction to the grader to please turn paper around or turn your head around. <laughs> Maybe that'll work. Anyway, uh, so how do you tell? Well, suppose it's x squared minus y squared plus z equals 0. I see two squares. I see opposite signs there. And so I know it's a hyperbolic paraboloid. If I just cover a y, then z has to equal minus x squared. So normally you put for these graphs, you make x, y, z here. So actually, z equals minus x squared means that along the x, z plane, this is where the negative is. And along the, when x is 0, you have z equals y squared. So that actually corresponds to this picture here. It's not a rotation of it. But unfortunately, if it were minus x squared plus y squared, then you'd have to kind of redraw this picture. Um, and that's a really hard thing to do. I actually only know how to draw it this way. So I would, I would actually relabel this instead of x, y. I'd say, oh, look, y, x, z. If I did have to draw it with the different axes, I would actually turn the page on its side and just draw this. Of course, I think most of the time I've seen this, the question will either be draw it or describe it. Here is my advice. Do both. Do both. And if you think the picture is lame and you can't do a better job in the time allotted, right, I know the picture is lame, but here's what it is. It's an ellipsoid that has, you get the idea. I, I think that this, a picture is worth a thousand words, but if the picture sucks, then the words are, are useful. Okay? So I would, I would advise you to do both. Uh, and try not to contradict what you've drawn. I mean, if it really, if it's an ellipsoid and you draw this, <laughs> you'll get it wrong no matter which one it is. Okay? All right. So at this point, here's what I'd like to do. We've still got a little more time before. I, I do want to spend the last hour, if possible, on moving on to, to the, the newer material from last week. But the question that I have is this. And I, and I think there's actually one more topic that I have to cover for the quiz anyway. So does anyone have the equation of a surface that they would like to do as an example? Anyone bring any examples? Something from the homework that you weren't happy with, something like that? If not, I have some examples. I can just pick one or two. Anyone? You know, you're welcome to bring problems to these review sessions. They're not problem sessions, but, <laughs> you know. Anyone? All right. 
Well, anyone have a left? Uh, I guess if I just pick one and we don't know what it is, then we can just do it. So here's one. Well, I'll tell you what. There are five from that were on the spring 2003 final. I don't know how that happens, but apparently that's what they had. So here are the five x squared plus y squared minus 3z squared equals negative equals 5. 2 is the same except minus 5. 3 was x minus 2y squared minus 4z squared equals 0. 4 was x squared minus 2y squared minus 4z squared equals 0. And finally, the fifth one is x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 2x plus 2y plus 2z. All right? Well, the question was in following surfaces. So, you know, even if you just even if you're going to do it in words, then you still need to describe the things properly. And it's not so easy. So, shall we just do all five of them? Yeah. Okay, it won't take too long. According to my classification, without even thinking about it, the first one, two squares, it's in standard form, in fact. You didn't even have to rearrange it. It should be a hyperboloid of one sheet. So you could write hyperboloid of one sheet. But I don't think that's the full credit, if you just wrote that. See, the thing is, you haven't taken into account the 3. So it's actually compressed by a factor of 1 over root 3 in the z direction. OK, so we also discussed this. If you replace x squared, if instead of x squared you have, say, 4x squared, think of that as 2x all squared. And so wherever you had x before, you now have 2x. So that means that the picture is squashed by a factor of 2. What was 1 before is now a half, because a half times 2 is 1. So multiplying by a squared has the effect of compressing by a. Question? So multiply by 5 first if you're comparing them to 2. Ah, that's the other point. Maybe there's a 5 on the right, and, and uh, and so maybe we should divide by 5 first. The way I would really like to approach the problem that doesn't even involve division by 5 is just to work out where the intercepts are. And then I think that everything would be in the correct perspective then. So if I'm going to just draw this, here's the y, here's the z, here's the x. Where are the intercepts? Let's just say it. Well, I know I'm supposed to get a hyperboloid of one sheet. So it looks something like this. And I, it shouldn't have any z intercepts. Well, indeed, if x and y are both 0, you get minus 3z squared is 5, which is impossible. Why does it not have uh, z intercepts? intercepts? Well, look at the picture. It doesn't intersect the z-axis. But look at the equation. Set x and y equals 0, and what do you get? You get minus 3z squared is 5, which is impossible. Z, z squared has to be positive, so minus 3z squared has to be negative. So in any case, the x and y intercepts x squared equals 5, so x equals plus or minus root 5. So actually, this bottom circle here, and it is a circle because this is root 5, this is minus root 5, this is root 5, and this is minus root 5. So the y intercept is also plus or minus root 5, as you can see. So actually, the cross sections are circles, and it's kind of hard to deal with the 3. The point is, if this is what it would be like with the 3, then without the 3, it would be stretched by a factor of root 3. So how do I deal with that? I don't really have a good way of dealing with it. I can't really demonstrate it unless I actually mark in one point on the curve. So if I wanted to do that, say pick z equals 1, maybe I'll do z equals 1. Well, that's not a very good scale. When z equals 1, I have x squared plus y squared equals 8. So it's a circle here. z equals 1, circle, radius, root 8, which is also 2 root 2. 
just to give a sense of how quickly these circles are expanding. Now, why are they circles, by the way? How would they be ellipses? What, 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 what would change if they were ellipses? Yeah. Right, the coefficients in front of x squared and y squared would be different. If they're the same, you get these circles like this. If they're different, then the x or the y will be stretched in different ways. All right, so that's the first one. For the second one, we can do very quickly, without much more work, what is the, what is the deal here? Two sheets. So actually, I'm still unhappy with this first one. I haven't really shown the fact that it should be more compressed in the z direction. So that's my first attempt. But what I really like to do is just redraw it to be more compressed. Think of the cone that you would get. It should, the ratio of the slopes should be 1 to root 3, or, or really 1 over root 3. That's the slope of the cone. Where do I get root 3 from? It's the, it's the size of, uh, it's the ratio of the x and y and the z. So maybe instead of burbling about this, I, let, let me just, I'm spending too much time on question one, but then it will come back when we do question two, it'll be obvious. So maybe I can really, I mean, we're on nine out of 10 here, but possibly 10 out of 10, but I think we can do better and we don't even need that circle of radius one. Let's just consider x squared plus y squared minus three z squared equals zero. Not five, not minus five, but zero. What does that look like? Well, from what I've said, so if this is the positive x direction, positive y, positive z, it's a cone, and the cross sections are, are circles. But if x equals 0, you have y squared equals 3z squared, which means that y is plus or minus the square root of 3 times z. So we've got to draw the line if z equals plus or minus 1 over root 3 y. So z equals a number less than 1 y and also the negative version of it. So we get a, a cone that's quite fat, but whose cross sections are circles. So that's what that one would look like. So this means that the one sheet hyperboloid is the revolution of this, where this is root 5, and this is minus root 5. So it'll be this. So I've kind of compressed them on one diagram. Basically, I want to redraw this, but squished. So I'll put in these asymptotes. This is the best way to do it. Put in the asymptotes. This is the x-axis here. And these asymptotes have slope 1 over root 3 and minus 1 over root 3. And then the hyperboloid we're looking for is this. As I said, it's very similar to the other one, but I'm showing the compression properly. Okay, then I don't need to mark in a circle. So the other one is exactly the same, but you'll see if you have x squared plus y squared, so this is problem number two now, minus 3z three squared, three squared is minus 5. Now there is a z-intercept. The z-intercept, you have to solve minus 3z squared equals minus 5. So the solution is z equals plus or minus root 5 over 3. And so we'll get the two-sheeted hyperboloid also in the same slope, x, y, z, here's the slope 1 over root 3 in the y, z plane, and now I'll get the two-sheeted hyperboloid that is also squished and the intercept here is root 5 over 3 and that's minus root 5 over 3. So a hyperboloid of two sheets hyperboloid of one sheet, they're both asymptotic to the cone of slope 1 over root 3, circular cone. The first thing I want to do is multiply by minus 1 just for my sanity. Now there are two squares 
They are two squares. They are of the same sign. And so I've rubbed out the, cu the classification, but what do we think it is? A paraboloid. Whenever there are, there's one linear term without any square with it, it's a paraboloid. But you've got to decide whether it's, it's not a paraboloid or one of the icky, icky paraboloids, uh, as in the saddle point one. So which one is this? It's one of the nice ones. So it's a per elliptical paraboloid. That's what it's going to be. So we already know elliptical paraboloid. Okay, do you all see how I came up with that classification? This, no square. It's a paraboloid. Y squared plus C squared, same sign, elliptical. Different signs would be hyperbolic, hence the wires around each other. Okay, so now we just have to make sure we draw it correctly. Here's the Y, here's the Z, here is the X. So cover up the Z and look at what the xy equation should be. So if z equals 0, I get x equals 2y squared. So that's a parabola in y with positive x. So it's actually along here. This is x equals 2y squared. Whereas if you cover up, if, if you let y equals 0, you get x equals 4z squared. So actually, it's even steeper in that direction. So the cross sections are going to be ellipses, which are a little, they're, they're uh, fatter in the y direction than they are in the z direction. Okay, it's again a pretty lame drawing, but I think I can just redraw it and do better. Now that I know it's a paraboloid, that should be. Make it nice and wide because it's a parabola. Parabolas just keep getting wider. So elliptic paraboloid. Well. And if you want to mark in a point or two, there's no intercepts other than at the origin, unfortunately. But if you want to mark in a point, you could sort of say, well, let's let x equals 1. And then you solve for what these things are. You'll see y is 1 over root 2. That's a half. That just comes from shoving it in here. So you could actually put in the points here. 1 goes to y is 1 over root 2. Whereas the z height here, this is at x equals 1. The z height is just 1 half. And 1 over root 2 is bigger than 1 half. OK? Any questions about that example? All right, well, we better go on to problem 4, which is x squared minus 2y squared minus 4z squared equals 0. Well, 2 minus 1 plus, I guess I can rewrite it as x minus x squared plus 2y squared plus 4z squared equals 0. Three squares, sure, but not all pluses, so it's a hyperboloid of some sort. Because there's a 0 here, it's a cone. Okay, So it's very similar to the previous one. We just need to make sure we get the directions and the dimensions right. So first of all, the direction is going to be, which way is it going to open up? Along the x-axis, bless you, because the x is a different sign. So it's got to look like this somehow. Again, let z equals 0 and work in the xy plane. And you'll see that x squared equals 2y squared. So this is when z equals 0. So x is plus or minus root 2y. So if I draw that, it's actually steeper. Here's x, here's y, and I get these lines here. Whereas if y equals 0, then x is plus or minus 2z by taking square roots. So it's actually steeper even in that direction. So x, z. So basically, the cross sections are going to be ellipses like this.
Oh, yeah. Ah, it's pretty lame. So redrawing that would be good, but I'll leave that as an exercise to you. You see how the ellipses work? This time they're a little bit fatter in this direction than they are in that direction. And it's all because of the interplay. See, 2 and 4. Actually, here is 2 and 4 as well. So uh, what am I saying? <laughs> exactly. Am I getting this the wrong way around? Probably. Probably. Uh, the ellipses should be the same. What is going on here? X, well, okay, it depends on your perspective. <laughs> Everything does. If I draw x is equal to plus or minus root 2y, <laughs> bless you, then the slope is not as steep. So here's y equals 1. Ah, yes. The thing to do is to set x equals 1. And then you'll see y is again 1 over root 2. And z is equal to 1 half, which is smaller. So if I had drawn it correctly, the ellipse should be this, it should also be stretched out in this direction. But this time it's a cone. OK, so now I have to do the redraw. Now I'm going to leave it to you. Work out how to draw ellipses that look like this and get smaller and then go bigger without, without changing the x and y around. I don't know a good way. I'll leave it to you. Got to leave you something. Of course, you could then just describe it as an elliptical cone and draw a cross section of some of the ellipses. Let's just do the last one, which is actually the easiest one. It looks the hardest, but what's the big trick? Yeah, complete the square. Put it all over. x squared minus 2x plus y squared minus 2y plus z squared minus 2z equals 0. And now just add 1 here, add 1 here, add 1 here, and so you have 3. And then factor into x minus 1 all squared plus y minus 1 all squared plus z minus 1 all squared equals 3. So what is that? It's not just an ellipsoid, it's a sphere. What's the center of the sphere? 1, 1, 1. What's the radius of the sphere? Root 3. Sphere, center, 1, 1, 1. Radius, root 3. 1, 1, 1, root 3. There you go. You can draw it. There you go. Is that yours? Yeah, no. thanks. All right. Any more questions about services? You know, later. All right. We will now take a 10 second seltzer break. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's my phone. Is it vibrating? That's okay. I'm in the middle of something now. All right. <laughs> I am leaving chapter 12 and moving on to chapter 13. Sorry? It was only a 10 second break. I got a lot more to do, unfortunately. All right. Please, please, please. Okay. Chapter 12 was all about replacing the number line and functions on a number line with, or quadratic and linear functions, with now vectors and three-dimensional space. So chapter 13 exploits a sort of different thing that three-dimensional space has. See, a function of two variables, when you plot it in three dimensions, becomes a surface. So surfaces are the analog of graphs. However, in three dimensions, you can also have a curve, which you don't really have the analog of in two dimensions. It would just be a point. So we've got to do something a little bit different. Three dimensions, curves. So there are a lot of sections in Chapter 13, but we're only looking at two of them, the sort of the elementary stuff. All right, so that's what I want to talk about for the rest of today. Um, 
Bef and then the next thing to talk about is calculus, actually limits and stuff, and that's in chapter 14. So I just want you to understand as you're doing this course that everything is paralleling single variable calculus, except that, of course, with the extra dimension, there's a lot more complexity. All right, so we've got to talk about curves in space. Was that a Muppet sketch? Oh, no. You guys are too young to know what I'm talking about. All right. So I want to consider a function r of t. Now remember how lines were parameterized by a variable t, a real variable, a scalar variable t. Well, it doesn't have to be a line. It could be any sort of curve. So the idea is, I think of t as sort of being like time. At time 0, I'm at some vector. So I think of this as x of t, or I guess the book writes f of t, g of t, h of t. So I have three functions of t in the different coordinates. So at time t equals 0, you just plug in 0 into each of these functions and see what you get. And you get some point, some point in space. It's actually a vector, but we're thinking of an origin to that point. So that's where the, the, the particle is. And now, as, as you increase t from 0 up to 1, up to 2, and of course, it's not just 0, 1, 2, but it could be a half. It could be any real number, in fact then this will change. And it will start describing different points in space. It could be discontinuous, could just jump back and forth. But typically, we'll be looking at paths which are continuous. So you you got to map out some curve in space. And you know sometimes it might go slowly. Other times, it might speed up. It might stop even. It could even go backwards. That would be kind of nasty. But nevertheless, so the curve is not just the curve. Do you want me to just silence it? Is it bothering you? You're worried that it will fall behind. The phone, the phone, look, ha! Ah, no, it's not going to bite. Okay, sorry, I didn't put it all the way on silent. Now it's on silent. <laughs> sorry. Every time it vibrated, it's just like, ah, oh, my phone is ringing. <sighs> OK, I, enough, enough. Look, back to curves in space. Now, the classic example is cosine t, sine t, t. This is the most sort of classic, as I say, example of a curve in space that's just different from anything you see in a plane. And this is actually a helix. And the reason is, that without the t, we get our, rel our well-known parameterization of the circle. So every 2 pi, it just winds around a circle in the plane. But the third dimension, t, as that's increasing, you're going up and up and up. So actually, you're drawing a circle, except that now you've got to put a vertical impetus. So you get a helix, or a spiral type of shape. Now the helix moves around the circle of radius 1. And here's the z-axis. So it will start at time 0. It starts, I'm now going to call this x. Well, no, I'll call it y, be consistent, whatever. So at time 0, it starts at 1, 0, 0. So plug in 0, and you get cosine 0 is 1, sine 0 is 0, and t is just 0. And it would just wind around this circle, except that it has, as I said, this height. And so by time 2 pi, it's gone a complete revolution, but it has gained a height of 2 pi. So this is z equals 2 pi. So the way it's done here is that every and going, and t can be negative and you get the complete helix going up to and uh, infinity and minus infinity. Of course, there are variations. You could have cosine 3t, sine 3t, t. What that would do is go around the circle twice, uh, three times as fast. So a revolution is done in time 2 pi over 3, say. Or this could be 5t, which would stretch the thing back to 5. 
So these are variations of the same curve. But you ought to know what a helix looks like. Of course, if the t was in the first coordinate, instead of sticking up, it would stick along the x-axis. A question. Uh, can there be elliptical helices? Oh, sure. There could be elliptical helix, helices. If you put a 3 there and a 4 there, that would parameterize an ellipse. And then, so instead of just going around the ellipse, it would go like that. So it would be an elliptical helix. Sure. Uh, if I change the t to t cubed or something, it would also be a helix-like object. But see, t, t cubed means the z starts off going fairly slowly until you get to 1, and then it gets quicker and quicker. Right? I mean, t cubed slow and then up. So the helix, if this was t cubed, the helix would look, would be tightly bunched around the beginning, but then it would, well it's all supposed to be on the same cylinder, but it would get wider and wider. The gaps would get wider and wider. So of course this is not the only type of curve, but it, it is a kind of cool first example to see because we it's, it's purely three-dimensional. By the way, there's a left-handed helix and a right-handed he helix, and they are completely different. There's a, there's a right-handed helix. If I just go around the other way, for example, change this to sine t and cosine t, if you do that, then instead of parameterizing this circle in the plane, or the circle this way, you actually start here and go the other way. So that means that you'll get actually a opposite direction helix. The same effect would be if you took this but put a minus t. And uh, this is of interest in, even in biology. Believe it or not, you can have certain helices like, you know, there are plenty of, well, DNA is a double helix, but there are plenty of single helix type of proteins. And uh, if you synthesize, they, all, they normally come in right-handed versions, actually, in, in nature. And it turns out that if you just take some simple sugars, or I don't know exactly what the compounds are, but some of these helices, if you synthesize them in the lab, the same chemical formula, but have the helix going the other way, then it's actually poisonous. It's the same chemical, but it's like the anti-version. It's your mirror. Your mirror image has that, that, uh, that protein, and yet it's poison to you. So go figure. Anyway, enough about biology. So that's the basic concept. Now, a little bit of notion of limits. We need to understand, at least in principle, we're going to do some more stuff in practice. We need to have at least a theoretical idea of what it means to say the limit as t goes to, say, t0 of r of t is l. So. Again, section 14 is a more computational version of this, 14.1. Uh, but for the moment, I just want to sort of get a picture of what's going on with this curve in space. I have some curve, and it's wandering out in space. Of course, I can't draw it like that, so I draw it like this. And then somehow, I want it to approach some vector in space, L, which is a vector. So here's 0, here's r at different times, and here's my limiting vector l. And I want to say that when t, the time, gets very close to t0, maybe left-sided or right-sided, I'm thinking of the past and the future, but as I'm, when the time is very close to this specific time, midnight, whatever, 3 seconds, 7 seconds, whatever t0 is here, I want r to be very close to L. Now, actually, r could mysteriously jump to some other point here. This could be r of t0, but that doesn't affect the limit. Remember the one variable case? If you just remove this point and stick it anywhere else or even make it undefined, then the limit is still this height. Right? Remember that from? single variable calculus, the, the value of the function at the limit point doesn't matter. The same thing happens here. It doesn't matter what r of t0 is, it only matters what happens for times near t0, t0. You want then to be very close to L. So this means that when t is very close, to t0, t0, r of t 
will be close to L. How close? In fact, arbitrarily close. It doesn't just get close, it gets as close as you like. So if you want R T to be really, really close to L, still, then you just must insist that T is very, very close to T0. The subtle difference just between what I wrote and what I said. So in fact, as close as you like. So it's the same definition as it was before. Except that, what do I mean when two vectors are very close? How do I specify when two vectors, r of t and l, are very close? How would you do that? Someone give me a vague stab in the dark. Magnitude of what? what? And direction of what? Of what? Which vector? We've got two vectors. Here's r, here's l. How do you know if they're close? Take the... No, don't even need anything that fancy. Yeah. Take the difference between them. So consider r of t minus l. So that's, so if here, if I want r of t to be very close to l, the distance is going to be here. The difference, rather, is going to be here. How do I, so what do I actually need to do with that vector now? The, what's more important of it, the magnitude or the direction? Magnitude. The magnitude. So I want this. This measures how close. The length of this vector measures how close r of t is to l. And I want that to be small. So the formal definition then, and I know in Math 103 and 104, or probably possibly the equivalents in AP versions, we don't really do epsilons and deltas very deeply. Some of you might have seen it. But because this is a second level course, 201, so we're supposed to talk a little bit about epsilons and deltas. I doubt, though, that many problems, if any, would actually require them, although it's possible on a quiz you might see it. This is, this is in the gray area that I'm not sure of. I haven't seen the quiz. I don't set the quiz. And I, the best thing is to ask your instructor, hey, could we be tested ever on epsilons and deltas? Does anyone actually ask that yet? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? OK, let me, let me show you epsilons and deltas, and then you can ask whether you would actually be examined on them. Here's what I'm going to insist. If you want r of t minus l to be very small, and I think of epsilon as a very small, tiny number for some small number, but it's not zero. If you want this, is, this to be true, then you just have to choose another small number, possibly different. Delta, another Greek letter. So epsilon and delta are both small numbers. So if you want this to be true for some particular small, so let me say some particular small number epsilon, which you just choose, pick out of the air, then you just have to choose another delta so that t minus t0 is less than delta. If you can do that, then you have your limit. If this is always possible, then you have your limit. So what does it mean? What on earth does this mean? Here's my mystical limit L. And I want the path to have limit L at time t0. This set of all possible vectors where the difference from L is less than epsilon is actually a sphere centered at L radius epsilon. So this is a little sphere. So what I want, actually, in order to get this limit, is that when I'm near time t0, I want b to be in the sphere. So basically, 
I need to narrow down my focus. I need to throw away most of the time. Here's the magic time to zero. I need to take a few seconds or milliseconds before and a few milliseconds afterwards. And I want the curve to be always within those few milliseconds. So I ignore, 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 ignore. Ah, start the clock. Bring the curve is in here. I don't actually care what happens at the, at the midnight stroke. But just before midnight and just after midnight, the curve has to be in that bubble. And so this says for times t minus t0, this is actually the same thing as saying that t is less than midnight plus a little bit, but greater than midnight minus a little bit. So delta is the few milliseconds. OK, so think of it this way. You pick your little sphere. I'm just repeating myself. Ignore the times up until a certain time just before the time you're interested in, and then start looking at it and then go through the magic time a little bit further and then stop. And what you want is the... ...how small the bubble is, then you have your limit. So it's, it's all very well to do it for one bubble, but what if the, the situation for your one bubble looks like this? Then, when you pick a smaller bubble, it's not in there at all. So it has to be true for no matter how small the bubble is. Now, if the bubble is smaller, then maybe instead of milliseconds, you have to look at microseconds. You know, you have to really home in on it. That's OK. The delta that you chose can, for one particular epsilon, doesn't have to apply for every epsilon. Well, look, if you don't understand that, I don't think it's such a big deal. As I said, it may be that this never gets examined. But at this level, you're supposed to have at least some idea of what I'm talking about. Who has no idea of what I'm talking about, honestly? That's OK. That's OK. These things are by no means easy to, to grasp on the first viewing. Uh, what I suggest is that you email me, uh, have a think about it, try to draw some sketches of it. There's some examples in the book. Try to get in, uh, grips on this, and, or even see me afterwards um, for some more depth. But because it's not still really examined, and this is supposed to be a review session, I kind of want to get on the more practical aspects. So please uh, forgive me for spending not more t well, no more time on it if you don't know what I'm talking about. All right. Anyway. Here is something that is quite important. From limits, I have the continuity. And continuity means that there isn't a hole there at the limit. Instead, if there is a limit, then the value at that time is exactly where you would expect. It's in that hole. However, what we're really interested in is differentiation. So let's get very practical and say, suppose we have A curve in space, R of t, which is given by these three functions for each of the coordinates. What is the derivative of the curve? Well, what I'd like to do is write down dr dt. So maybe it's best to write it like this, dr dt of t. This is just going to be the derivative of each of the components. OK, well, that's a definition. In fact, the proper way to define it is, so the formal way of defining it, just for yox, and just because it might come up, is we want the limit as h goes to 0 of r of t plus h minus r of t divided by h. It's the same formula as it is regularly, but this is now the difference between two vectors. And this is really the scalar 1 over h times the vector. So you have to interpret this as the scalar multiple of a difference between two vectors, but it works out to be exactly this, which is beautiful. 
it's beautiful. There's a proof in the textbook, and it's not very difficult. You just separate into the i, j, k components. So the question is, we can now easily calculate this, but what does it mean? What does it mean? Well, it has a beautiful geometric meaning. Here is some curve that I'm thinking of in space. It also works in two dimensions, but think of this as coming in and out. So at each time, t, I know where we are. r of t, here's my origin. r of t is that vector. At a little bit time later, here is r of t plus h. The difference vector looks like this. r of t plus h minus r of t. So this is the difference, delta r. And of course, when I divide by h, it gets smaller. Actually, depends how big h is. When h is really tiny, it actually gets bigger. Because 1 over a small number is big. So if you have a limit, then this point moves closer and closer and closer, and this vector gets smaller but gets stretched out and stretched out. And so, without much further ado, I present the correct interpretation of the derivative. Here is r of t. Then this is d dt of r of t, otherwise known as maybe r prime of t. It is a tangent vector. It is a tangent vector to the curve. Now remember, vectors have no base point. You can shift them around as long as you keep the direction. So when I say it's a tangent vector, I mean if you shift the base to be at r of t. So if you actually drew it, the derivative would be down here. This would be r prime of t as well. But if you take your 0 and shift the vector so it's at r of t, then you'll get a tangent to the curve. Kind of nice, huh? Now, the question is, what can you say about the magnitude of this? What do you think the magnitude has to do with? Right? A tangent is just a line. So how long is this vector? Well, it depends how fast you're going. Right. If you're going like this, it'll be a longer vector than if you're going like this. And actually, if you just stop here for a little while and go on, it will be 0. So it doesn't show you which direction the tangent is there. How about, though, the direction as to whether it's this way or this way? What does that mean? Anyone tell me? Someone else? Which way you're going? Yeah, I mean, if you're going this way as opposed to going this way, as time increases, then you get a direction. So it's not just a tangent to the curve. It is a velocity vector. So actually, v is d dt of r of t with exactly that same formula as up there is the velocity vector. So in some sense, if you're moving along here, then at that time you're going that way. You're going that way. Sure, eventually you end up diverting, but at this moment that's the direction you're heading. That's where your speed or that's where your velocity is. If there was no force at that point, then this wouldn't happen. You would just keep on going. If there were no more forces. You would just keep on going in that direction with that speed. All right? So the interpretation then is that the length of v is the speed. So actually, v, I should have written as v of t because your velocity can change. So v of t, the length of that vector, is the speed at time t. So we're redoing our physics within the math context as allowing now a particle to move in space at any time. We know where it is. That's the r. If we differentiate, we know its velocity, which we're now thinking of as a vector, also in space, whose base point really should be thought of as being attached to the point where the particle is, and whose length gives you how fast it's going. All right? Any questions about that concept so far? All right, well, what if you differentiate again? You get a of t is d dt of r of t 
which of course, uh, I'm sorry, ddt of v of t, which of course is the second derivative of r of t. And this is the acceleration vector at time t. So in this case, for the curve to go down like this, there must be some acceleration in this direction at, at these times. Or else it wouldn't be curving around at all. It would just keep going in the direction of the speed. Now, the beauty of this is it's really easy to compute. You just have three functions. You just differentiate each of them separately. So I think as an example, maybe I can pick something from a previous quiz. It says, so this is from a quiz from fall 05. So it's totally fair game. It says a curve is given by r of t is minus cosine t sine t t squared, where you have 0 less than or equal to t less than or equal to 6 pi. And so the first part is to sketch it. Well. We shouldn't be surprised to think that it's a helix. We just have to make sure we get the direction of the thing right. So I think the easiest thing to do is just to sketch first the xy plane, just as if ignore the t squared, and see what minus cosine t sine t does. So from 0, t equals 0, you get minus 1 comma 0. Now t equals pi over 2, you'll get 0, 1. So already we get the sense that it's going around this way. And indeed, if you plug in pi, you'll get x is minus cosine pi, which is 1, 0. So that's great. How many revolutions do we do between 0 and 6 pi? How many revolutions do we do between 0 and 2 pi? 1. 0 and 6 pi will be 3 revolutions. We're going to make 3 revolutions going This is positive and this is negative. Here is z. We actually need to start at minus 1 here and move to 1. So this is the circle, but we've got to wind our way up. How high will we be when we finish? 36 pi squared. And again, t squared looks like this. So the z coordinate, here's, here's time now. And here's z. So it's actually got to get faster as it winds its way up. So we need to somehow sketch a helix that goes around clockwise that does three loops. Did I do enough? No, there's one, two. So I need to do a third one that's even bigger and ends up there. And this is now 36 pi squared. And I apologize for writing all over the board. So you will have to do a better job when you draw it. So the main features are, it starts here at minus one, zero. It has three loops around a circle of radius one. And the loops get more spaced as it's going on. That's what I'd like to see if I were grading. I would probably also like to see that it wasn't on top of the other writing, but you know, that's only for bonus points. All right, any questions about that sketch? All right. So now, two, part two, compute the velocity and acceleration at time t. Well, I have r of t, I just recopy, minus cosine t, sine t, t squared. So v of t is r prime of t. Just differentiate minus cosine to get sine plus sine. Derivative of sine is cosine. Derivative of t squared is 2t. 
and the acceleration vector is the derivative of this. So this will be cosine t minus sine t, comma 2. Jolly good. Now, my question is, part 3, is the particle speeding up or slowing down? at t equals 4 pi. How do you do this? How do you normally do this? You look at acceleration, right? So if the acceleration is positive, it's speeding up. If the acceleration is negative, it's slowing down. Unfortunately, the acceleration is negative. What's your idea? Look at the magnitude. Well, the magnitude of any vector is positive. Look at the limit of acceleration. Look at the velocity and acceleration in the same direction. Ah, now we're talking. Is that what you were going to say? Velocity and the acceleration are in the same direction? Yeah. Yeah, see, suppose the velocity is this way and the acceleration is backwards. If they're actually in opposite directions, you're going to be slowing down. If they're in the same direction, you're going to be speeding up. But what if they're like this? I can see they're in the same direction or well, you could take the cross product, for example. But suppose it's like this. Suppose that's the acceleration and that's the vector, that's the velocity. Is it slowing up or is it speeding down? I don't know. <laughs> what did I say? Slowing up, <laughs> speeding down. Is it speeding up or slowing right? Okay. Okay. Let me just answer the question for you. And in this, in in the process, we will. We will learn something. Okay. Sorry? Well, okay. The, there's many different ways of doing it or thinking about it. Let me show you a little bit of theory and then we'll come back and do the problem. Consider this. First of all, so here's an aside. Consider R, the magnitude of R of T. This is kind of messy because it involves the square root. So the nicest thing to do is to take the square. There is a lovely formula in terms of a dot product of two vectors. Actually, if you take the dot product of any vector with itself, you get the length of the vector squared. So suppose we try to do this, d dt of the length squared. Well, if there's any justice in the world, and there is, there is a product rule, which says that you get the first one dot the derivative of the second one plus the derivative of the first one dot the second one. D U V equals v du dx plus u dv dx. That's exactly this formula, but in terms of dot products. So maybe I need an aside from the aside. And without, I don't want to get bogged down in these things, but if I have any two vectors fields, well, suppose I have a vector field and just a function, regular old function. this. Okay, I have a vector function and a regular function. So I can form a new function f of t times r of t. It's a pretty bizarre object, but at time t I get a vector and this is a scalar. So this is a scalar times a vector. So what do you think the derivative of this is? Well, product rule works. You get the regular derivative as a number times the vector r plus the function times the derivative vector r. So everything you think should work, works. So this is for a scalar times a vector. That's one type of, remember last week I said there are three types of multiplication? I called this mult one, number one. Here's another type of multiplication. Suppose we now have two vector functions, as in curves, well, the derivative of their dot product 
r of t dot s of t is exactly what you'd hope it would be. r prime of t dot s of t plus r of t dot s prime of t, where all of these primes are exactly the, what we've just done. You just differentiate all the coordinates. And finally, the derivative of the cross product also has the correct product rule. You just have to make sure you always put r first. You've got to get the order right in this case. So here, you need r of prime of t cross s of t plus r of t cross s prime of t. You can't put the r. You've got to put the r first. So those are the three product rules for vectors and scalar functions and vectors, are, in this case, interacting together. And so I'm using the middle one of these formulas here. So away from the aside of the aside, unless there are any questions about those product rules, these are all the product rules. You know, since you know the regular product rule, it's almost don't even learn them. Just do what comes natural, as long as you know the product rule, and everything will be fine. So, OK, we get this. Now, let's go back to here and notice that the dot product doesn't care which way around it is. So, so this is 2 r of t dot r prime of t. So this is true in general, that the derivative of the length squared is twice the vector times its velocity vector. So another way of looking at it is this. Now what if you instead apply to the velocity vector, the length of the velocity vector squared? Well, now you'll get 2v of t dot a of t, right? Because I get actually, well, let's do it in two steps. It's 2v dot v prime times 2. So it's the velocity vector dot its acceleration vector. All right. So what, what are we saying here? What are we saying? Well, the speed has to be positive. So the speed It's just the magnitude. It has to be positive or maybe zero. Because it's the length of a vector. The length of a vector has to be positive or zero. Okay? So the speed is just a, a, a magnitude. However, the velocity, as we've seen, is a vector. Now, how do you tell whether something's speeding up or slowing down in terms of absolute speed? You just see whether the speed is increasing. So the question is, is v increasing or decreasing? Well, the beauty of this is that you don't need to worry about this. You could also say, is the square of it increasing or decreasing? After all, if you have a positive number and it's getting bigger, then its square is also getting bigger. If it's getting smaller, its square is also getting smaller. So i.e., the same question, is ddt of this function positive or negative? If it's positive, that means... is 2 v of t dot a of t. And the 2 doesn't even matter because it doesn't affect it. So is v of t dot a of t positive or negative? That will tell you whether you're speeding up or slowing down. OK, your question? Yeah, we're just differentiating the, the absolute value. Well. You're differentiating the. Not the absolute value, but the length squared. Right. So then how do we, how do we not have length involved in, how do we get, how does, 
So the, the question is, how is it possible that when you differentiate the length squared, you don't get a length? Yeah. And the answer is that you can also think of a length squared as a dot product. So how is it that I can write length of v squared as v dot v? That doesn't have a length in it. It just works. Lengths and dot products are very much related to each other. The dot product is basically the difference between squares of lengths. It's one way we defined it. All right, so basically then, it's exactly what I was saying. V dot A tells you this. Here's V, I'm going this way. A, I'm tending this way. If V dot A is positive, that means the angle made between V and A is acute. And that means that we're accelerating maybe in a different direction, but still a lot of the acceleration is in the same direction as V. The projection will be along the direction of V. And so this will be speeding up. A dot V is positive. Whereas if the dot product is negative, that means the angle between them is obtuse. It's bigger than 90 degrees. And that means that the component of the acceleration in the direction of the velocity is actually negative. The projection is in the opposite direction of v, is another way of saying it. So a dot v less than zero, slowing down in absolute speed. Slowing up, slowing down, speeding up. The interesting thing happens when a dot v equals zero, and then you're actually neither speeding up nor slowing down but you're going in some sort of circular type of orbit. So an object in orbit, as in like the moon or a satellite, once it's stabilized, has a velocity that is perpendicular to its position. Maybe I better draw this. Here's the Earth. Here's the moon or the satellite. Here's the vector r. Here's the vector v at that time. However, the acceleration is this way, and that is orthogonal to the v. So the particle goes at the same speed, but the acceleration always pulls it back from going in the straight line, and the thing is in orbit if the balance is correct. All right, so a dot v is zero there because they're orthogonal. The particle is neither slowing up, uh, slowing down, nor speeding up. All right, so the moral of the story is, if you want to see whether the absolute, if a particle is speeding up or slowing down, just look at v, dot t, v of t dot a of t equals, in this case, in general, well, let's say v of 4 pi. That's what we care about time, 4 pi. Dot a of 4 pi equals sine 4 pi, cosine 4 pi, minus 8 pi dot cosine 4 pi <laughs> minus sine 4 pi 2. And we can simplify this to 0, 1, minus 8 pi dot, oh, it's positive 8 pi. I don't know where I got that minus from. Uh, yes, 4 pi times 2 is 8 pi. 0, 1, 8 pi dot 1, 0, 2. And if you were to get 16 pi, which is greater than zero, so speeding up. Some of the acceleration is in the same, the acceleration in the direction of v is in the same uh, direction as v as opposed to the opposite direction. All right? Okay. Any questions about that? I know I did a lot of theory from it, but hey, we did a product rule and. We saw something interesting about directions of this. I, I would actually know this. I would, I would sort of know all this, or at least the conclusion. That's something worth remembering. Now, there's only one more topic that I believe is in the quiz, which is something about speeds and arc lengths. So I've got to spend a little bit of time on that. Maybe 10 minutes is enough to do it. So we talked about the speed, right? We know what the speed is. Okay, here's the deal. Distance equals speed times time, right? We know that. So suppose you have a curve and you have two times. Time equals t0, time equals t1. And you want to know 
How far have you gone along? What is the length of that curve? Well, the way to do it is to use speed equals distance times time. All you do is say, oh look, in a small chunk of time, my, I'm sorry, distance equals speed times time. In this small chunk of time, the distance is this speed times the dt. So in this little bit of time, from t to t plus dt, the distance equals the speed times the time. That's that little bit of distance. To get all of the distance, I have to add them up the and if I integrate, then I actually not just add them up, but also let the dt go down to zero. So basically what it comes down to is that the arc length, or the length of the curve, is the integral from t0 to t1 of v of t dt. And that is just distance equals speed times time, but in a limiting sense. Okay, so you've seen that formula already. I don't know, I don't remember seeing, I mean you see this formula, but the, the interpretation of it is just distance equals speed times time. I don't know how well that was clarified in the book in particular. Anyway, it's not a very practical formula unless you have, if the curve is given by f of t, g of t, h of t, then we actually know that v is, you take the derivative and then you take the square root of the sum of the squares. So then the length is equal to very specifically df dt squared plus dg dt squared plus dh dt squared dt. Again, that formula is just that. And this is the one that makes sense. As in, that's just the natural formula. This one, however, is very similar to the formula if you did Math 104. You may remember the formula for arc length in parametric. It was exactly this, but there was no third coordinate. Anyone do 104 or the equivalent? You remember that formula for parametric? I know it was a while ago, but this is just the 3D formula, and it looks the same, except the extra coordinate. So I guess, as my last trick, what do I want to do? Maybe I don't have a nice arc length from a previous quiz, so I'll just compute the length of a helix. And then I think that will do. Uh, so how about this? Find the length of the helix four cosine t, four sine t, three t, where t goes from zero to pi over two. Well, you can use either formula. I actually like the, the first formula best. So I'll call this r of t. I have v of t is equal to the derivative, minus four sine t, four cosine t, three. And so the length of v is equal to the square root of minus 4 sine t all squared plus 4 cosine t all squared plus 3 squared. And you get the normal nice thing going on here. 16 sine squared t plus 16 cosine squared t plus 9. Sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. So this is root 16 plus 9 which is root 25, which is 5. So the speed along this helix is always 5. Actually, you're going at a constant speed as you work your way up. So you just have to know how much time it takes. And take a pi over 2. So we can immediately say that it's 5 pi over 2. The integration is kind of silly. We don't even need to do it. But hey, just for yokes, let's do the formula. The length is from 0 to pi over 2 of v of t dt, which is, as I said, the length from 0 to pi over 2 of 5. 
And that is not even a calculus integral, that's just 5 times pi over 2 units. So in general, the velocity at time t depends on t. The speed in most cases would be a function of t. It's just this is a special case how it turned out to be a constant. Um, in general, you'd have a tougher integral to do, but you can see that you, you know, all that's required is to do the integral. Normally, you have to do some trick involving some trig identity or something, completing a square or something in order to be able to integrate, because the square root can be pretty nasty. You may even have to do a trig substitution. So just because we're doing multivariable doesn't mean you can forget your single variable. All right, well, I'm a couple of minutes early. I guess you all want to go. Are there any questions before we've actually finished? Well, good luck on the quiz. Thank you.